Before we get started, we just wanted to thank Old Republic Surety for sponsoring this episode of Let's Get Surety, as well as NESBP's virtual seminars for the third year in a row. For more information on Old Republic Surety, visit www.orsurety.com. Now, on to our show. Listening to Let's Get Surety. Let me hear your bonding talk with Kat Shamapande. Hey everyone, it's Kat Shamapande. Welcome to this episode of Let's Get Surety. Today with me, I have my co host, Mark McCallum. Hey, Mark, thanks for being with me. Hey, Kat, great to be here. And today we're going to be talking about special purpose acquisition companies or SPACs. In order to do that, we have with us our guest today, NASBP immediate past president, Mark Munikawa. He is senior vice president of Surety with Woodruff Sawyer. Hey, Mark, thanks for being on. Well, it's a pleasure. I appreciate having the opportunity to, uh, again, speak to our industry. I am. We are happy to have you on with us today. So before we dive into SPACs, Mark, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself and about Woodruff Sawyer? Sure, and that actually may help uh, set up the dialogue we're going to have on SPAC. So um, I am a partner in charge of surety for Woodrow Sawyer. We are a 103-year-old insurance brokerage firm headquartered in San Francisco. Uh, we do have more of a national footprint now, but you know we're, we're still largely focused in Northern California. The reason I mention that is uh, Bob Sawyer, uh, the Sawyer of Woodrow Sawyer, now retired, Really, in the 70s and 80s, when you saw Silicon Valley really emerge and the investment banking community um, maybe pushing it along or riding along with it, um, Bob Sawyer and the other principals of the firm at that time had the foresight to really um, establish themselves in that market. And so over the years, as Silicon Valley, which is just maybe an hour south of our San Francisco headquarters, as that area started to grow, emerge, we had high tech, you no know, biotech, clean tech, green tech, um, now fintech, and because of that, um, we also have a, a fairly significant uh, profile with uh, private equity firms. So, even though our firm insurity is largely contract, that's really what I do. We have a lot of insurance clients who need surety bonds who are uh, technology, emerging technology companies, often tied to private equity firms, um, venture capitalists, and, and now SPACs. That's interesting. So well, before we kick off talking about the SPACs themselves, why is this topic important? What made you want to come on the podcast and talk about SPACs? Well, you know, in our recent virtual annual event, we did focus on future bonding opportunities. And as we look forward, I see SPACs having a role in uh, the future of, say, the investment community, Wall Street, however you want to call it. And it is going to impact mostly the commercial surety sector, at least as we've seen so far. You know, I give a lot of credit to the commercial surety underwriters. I think over the years, and I've been in business now over 40 years, uh, when I first started, we didn't say, talk about EBITDAs or you know, book-to-market ratios. And now when you talk to these uh, fairly sophisticated commercial surety underwriters, I think they've adapted and, and found ways to bring in kind of the Wall Street investment um, community's um, analytical tools. And I think SPACs is going to be maybe the next trend, if we want to call it that, where commercial surety underwriters are really going to have to think through the changing, you know, business of business. So, Mark, um, I, I need to take back a little bit. Could you tell me what a SPAC actually is? Well, a SPAC is an acronym for Special Purpose Acquisition Company. Um, again, we have SPACs, and then we'll also go into what is a DSPAC uh, process. But uh, a SPAC is essentially a what we call a blank check company. Uh, typically, it is um, investors, you know, Wall Street, uh, you know, big names that file the typical S-1 registration with the SEC um, to become publicly traded. They don't actually have an operating business. The purpose of the initial purpose of the SPAC simply is to raise funds. So if you go onto the SEC website, you find a SPAC, you look at their balance sheet, 
largely is cash, maybe some short term investments, but no really operating business. So it's a way to uh, generate funding to actually purchase an operating company that is private. So a SPAC is really maybe a uh, new way for pri- previously privately held companies to go public, but they do that by merging with the SPAC. So um, we see this trend as really having accelerated recently. You know, there's, everybody has their pros and cons about it. But I think that's why SPAC is important because we are going to see SPACs merging or essentially acquiring clients of ours, bond and principal, especially um, mm-hmm. firms in the technology space that maybe have commercial contracts. You, you, you're going to need to know the process in which SPACs acquire companies and how the company then moves forward as a publicly traded entity. Do do SPACs always know uh, a target company or do they raise funds and then decide or something in between? Yeah, you know, from what, talking to some people, it's really somewhat in between. I will tell you that when you look at a SPAC, their, their initial purpose is really to raise funding. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think they know kind of where what sectors are going to target. So, again, because of Woodrow Sawyer, our proximity to, say, Silicon Valley and handling a lot of tech firms, a lot of the SPACs have been set up really to merge or purchase emerging technology companies that really show significant growth potential. They may not have a capital base. Um, and, and the underwriters listening know what it's like to handle surety bonds for what we would call a pre-IPO or a company in development. It, it has certainly its challenges, but SPACs don't have to purchase a company right away. It could be months, even a year or two before they really find that right target and then go through the process of basically acquiring the company, what they call it an acquisition or merger uh, from a shorty perspective, um, we know that this privately held company now becomes public through a SPAC merger. It, it certainly sounds like, uh, you know, I in the news, I'll, I'll hear them reference a SPAC, but are SPACs that new? No, they really aren't. They've been around for a long time. I think um, the... The trend, especially in these last two years, we've seen so much growth in SPACs. It's, it's received a lot of attention, including from the SEC. Um, I know Warren Buffett mentioned SPAC in one of his recent right. pronouncements. It, it's um, generating a lot of interest. So, you know, I look back in 2010, there were seven SPAC issues. In other words, seven filings with the SEC for a group of investors set up basically a blank check company to raise funds. You know, it did grow a little by little. So I think in 2000, it was at 19, there were 59 uh, SPAC issues filed. Suddenly in 2020, there were 248. And through, uh, I think, February of this year, already 186 SPACs have filed with the SEC. You know, in the first three months of uh, 2021, it's actually been reported that SPACs have raised over $100 billion, which they are just sitting on looking to find acquisitions. Wow. That's a lot. Yeah. Exponential growth. Seems like it's something we need to be paying attention to. Well, you know, it's interesting you mentioned that, Mark, because when I did a little bit of research, I thought, well, you know, SPAC, we see SPACs again um, really targeting emerging growth technologies. I think that makes some sense because you're going to, they show or they have a promise of significant growth potential. But I did look just to see if there were any SPACs actually filed for the insurance industry. Okay. And actually, there have been a few SPACs filed who are going to target, they say, reinsurers, insure tech, which is not a surprise. Again, a, a technology play in insurance. Right. And even the brokerage community, um, if they exhibit certain growth. So will SPACs now compete against private equity in the, in the large brokerage market? You know, we don't know, but um, it was interesting to find that, uh, you know, I don't think our firm will merge with a SPAC. We are passionately private, and I like it that way. But, you know, yeah. SPACs are going to target the insurance in- industry now. Okay. Wow. It, you know, um, I it seems like the way that this works, you've got this large capital, but then experience management maybe elsewhere. seems like a uh, really interesting situation to try to underwrite uh, if, if that – uh, eventually, uh, the company 
that goes public uh, needs bonding. Is that true? You know, from our perspective, we've been through a few SPAC mergers. Um, and again, we have, uh, Woodrow Storage, just to step back again, we have a fairly sizable, um, we call management liability practice, DNO, cyber liability. Again, we're very tied to technology. We actually, actually have a group of um, individuals who are specializing in either transactional insurance or DNO for SPAC. So we've seen a lot of these deals, even if they don't have surety needs, you know, we see what is what is going on. But, you know, like everything else, and we, we talked about commercial surety underwriters or underwriting in general, you know, the three C's actually, I thought about this, actually still apply as you have maybe a bonded principal merging or being acquired by a SPAC. And to your point, Mark, you know, we talked first about uh, really character. You know, we handle right. a privately held company. We get to know the general counsel, maybe the head of uh, product development, their sales teams, suddenly they get essentially bought by a SPAC. Now, we typically will see most or all of the management that was really running the organization and, and hopefully will run the organization going forward, continue in their roles in the new organization. So we, character is still something that I think is important. When we talk about capacity, to me, that's an underwriting challenge. We have a client that was um, pre-IPO that maybe was at a certain level. Obviously, with the amount of funding that they're receiving through the SPAC merger, they are going to expand geographically. If they do commercial contracts, we're talking about larger contracts in terms of dollar value, maybe a larger backlog, however you wish to find it. You know, the scopes are much more elaborate. You may even have now uh, foreign bond needs. So from a capacity standpoint, the question is, can the uh, management of the privately held company transition to a publicly held company and continue to succeed really in a new company and really ex expanding the scope of operations? And then, of course, the other sea of capital, you know, obviously the infusion of cash really helps the balance sheet because a lot of these pre-IPO companies are yeah. struggling from a cash flow standpoint and that they right. may not even have positive net worth. Certainly with the merger of the SPAC and going public, it's going to look just like if they went through the traditional IPO. So your point to management is a, is an important one, but I you know look back to the basic three C's of surety underwriting and they do apply to kind of this the SPAC process from an underwriting standpoint. Right. It's, it's comforting that uh, the three C's even apply in this context. Uh, that doesn't go away. It's, it's fundamental to uh, surety and fundamental to a process going forward like this. Right. Now, I do add an I to the three C's. Okay. Uh, now, we're not going to do this as an industry. This is kind of what I when I, I just talked to a, a pre-IPO client. And we mm -hmm. talked about character, capacity, and capital, but I also threw in indemnity, right? Mm -hmm. Because that's yeah. something that you really got to think about when a, a previously privately held company goes through the SPAC merger. And we run into a lot, and I know a lot of brokers and underwriters run into this a lot when you have uh, firms that are owned and really operated by our private equity entity, and we don't have the indemnity. Mm. So if we have a privately held company that's going to go through a SPAC merger, we have the indemnity of the operating entity. But with the SPAC merger, our bonded principal, that name that is a principal on the bond, oftentimes will be now a subsidiary of a holding company once the, the SPAC merger goes through. Then the question from a surety standpoint is, do we now have to get a new indemnity agreement? Do we have to s make sure that we have indemnity upstream from the operating entity to the holding company, which is really the uh, publicly traded entity? And, you know, if you look at various general indemnity agreements from the various sureties, you know, does that successor language kind of incorporate? But typically we see this is a significant change really in the organization, just not a name change. Right. So oftentimes we're going to be looking at securing a new indemnity agreement to reflect the organizational structure of the company after the SPAC merger. So I do add I to the three Cs. How, uh, yeah. how willing is uh, that, that uh, indemnity flowing up to, uh, to actually occur? Well, and again, a lot of brokers listening will know what I'm talking about. So uh, I produce construction business, uh, mostly local, privately held, some family-run firms. And our joke is, you know, you, they know that bonds are tied to revenue. 
they know surety. You tell them you have to sign a surety indemnity agreement. They know what you're talking about. They don't like it, but they <laughs> sign it. Right. When we go to tech firms, even in their um, early stages when they first start, you know, oftentimes we have to talk to their uh, general counsel, who oftentimes has a specialty maybe in IP, patents, mm. not in contract, and certainly not in surety. So we have to spend a lot of time just explaining indemnity when they start. Now, when they merge, we may have new um, new individuals within the new organization, uh, especially those who are financing who uh, the organization now through the SPAC, who don't, again, understand why the surety needs indemnity. You know, the books, of, books and records clause, the PIF clauses, those are not typically what they see in a lot of contracts. So, um, unfortunately, when we had to secure a new indemnity agreement, we kind of start that whole negotiation process all over again. And <laughs> it, it gets time consuming and frankly, a little bit frustrating, but not just for me, also for our client. Yeah, I can see that because you're going through the, the whole thing over again when the SPAC merger takes place. Yes. So you exactly. mentioned um, the DSPAC process. Is that what happens after the merger? Yes, you know, it's interesting when I, um, again, I've talked to our um, insurance specialists and their focus really on, uh, again, I'm not an insurance expert, but in general, I see them offering insurance products really as they go through the process of uh, merging with a SPAC. And we also represent private equity interests, um, institutional investors. So we also insure SPACs. Um, so they're more uh, focused really on, at least at this point in, in our discussions, but we've been focusing on the SPAC merger, that specific transaction and, and the insurance coverages that are needed. And even insurance coverages like DNO, which really have, are pro- providing coverage, you know, after the merger takes place, but really related to, say, that merger transition. Mm-hmm. And from a surety standpoint, you know, I can tell you, we or I look at it a little bit differently. The SPAC merger is going to take place. And when they do, I may not even know the day it happens. You know, obviously we find out. And so that (laughs) DSPAC, once they merge with the SPAC, they have an operating entity with an ongoing business. And again, we find that a lot of these um, tech companies and merging technologies need commercial contract bonds. And again, for our audience, a lot of them know that writing um, commercial contract bonds for technology uh, companies, it has its challenge in terms of scope of work, you know, long-term warranty provisions, you know, performance mm. guarantees, and the like. So we are really, from a surety as a surety broker, we really look at these facts, not um, focusing on the transaction itself. We're looking at that DSPAC process where suddenly now they're a ongoing operation again but with a uh, much much more significant uh, cash balances and equity. And they're looking to leverage that to significantly increase their scope and, and their growth potential. Well, it sounds like you had mentioned all the education you have to do centering around indemnity. And then it sounds like you continue that education um, as they're looking to grow after the merger and then meeting their needs for uh, bonds as they pursue their business. Um, you, do you have any examples that you can provide of like, uh, m- maybe not specifics, but discussions you've had to help in that education process? Yes, well, so there's a, a few things that we talk about. One is we, we I would say myself and the others in our firm, the surety brokers, we have to have a discussion with a client, uh, you know, ahead of time, knowing that suddenly their financial position is going to be significantly different. And again, they're going to want to leverage the SPAC, say, investment in the operating entity in a significant way. So we talk about, you know, what are your growth plans? Mm-hmm. Um, and and what is it? And it's hard to translate that into surety, especially in, in technology, because we don't know what's going to get bonded and what's not. Okay. Um, that's always a challenge. So when we talk about you know what their general growth goals are, and then what, one thing we talk about is you know your surety. We like to match sureties, uh, at least our firm, um, with clients not just on individual personal relationships, and we value that with our underwriters, but we really want 
underwriting capacity, stability, and an underwriting philosophy that really matches with our client, whether that be construction or commercial. And so we have to think about um, the surety we use when a company first started, and there's certain sureties that are better at that than others. And suddenly, now they're a much larger organization with much greater, potentially much greater bond needs. And, and one thing we mm-hmm. talk about is, you know, do we re- need to reassess uh, your surety or sureties? Do we add another surety for a shared surety program? Do we go out and, and find a larger surety simp- that has simply greater capacity? And we're fortunate that for us, because again, we do a lot of tech, we have surety companies and underwriters that will write the first bond and, and they're just waiting for the company to go public, whether it be a traditional IPO or a SPAC merger. And, you know, they even say they, you know, we were with you in the beginning when they had no money. Now that they have all this money, they want to stay on board. They feel that that's the payoff for them. Right. So those are some, a few of the things that we, we have to think about in advance. My biggest concern always has been, and you know how surety works. They go through a SPAC merger that day. The next day, they need the largest bond, short contract surety bond <laughs> they've ever had. It's a five year annual contract, you know, with a 10 year O&M clause in there. And, um, you know, the state doesn't know what bond form they use, so they use a sticks and brooks construction form that doesn't even right. match the contract terms. So that's always my mm-hmm. big fear. Um, and so we have to get ahead of it, at least prepare ourselves for having an option or at least working with the current surety to make sure they're aware of the SPAC merger and to be prepared for a potentially, you know, well, frankly, greater premium growth for us, I suppose, but really more importantly, uh, making sure we have underwriting capacity lined up for the firm in its um, new state. Right. So if you had a crystal ball, Mark, do you think this is a trend or a, a, just a fad that might pass? Well, that that's always a good question. Like I, I think <laughs> I mentioned earlier, what happened in 20 and 21 was obviously a very significant um, increase in SPAC activity. Um, but not surprisingly, you know, when I did some research on uh, April 8th th- of this year, the SEC issued a public statement about SPACs. Um, <laughs> you'll read a, a lot more about them if you follow the usual, uh, I said, financial websites or however you wish to get your news. Um, there's a lot more, uh, frankly, scrutiny about, about SPACs. Now, um, you know, I, this is just a... Um, uh, a podcast about surety, so I don't want to certainly weigh in on is it good, is it bad, is it better for invest- investors, is it not? That's really not my area of expertise, and I know I'm not even supposed to share in my opinion in that regard. Um, <laughs> but all from all appearances, SPACs are continuing, and with just the first quarter of 2021, now slow down a little bit, but just with the first quarter of 2021. You know, 2021 is still going to be maybe the biggest year for SPAC uh, filings, even surpassing 2020. You know, what happens in 22, 23, Mark, I know we've had discussions with uh, surety company execs, with our our broker members. You know, nobody knows what's going to happen as uh, what we believe the economy to to reopen. Um, We're already seeing it. Um, You know, what's the economy going to look like? You know, what are the feds going to do? Certainly, when it comes to SPACs, you know, what is the SEC and other regulators going to look at? Uh, there's been some very high-profile notable SPACs like Virgin Galactica, DraftKings, you know, Open Door, but there are some that it really haven't fulfilled their promise. And uh, you know, how will the reg- regulators react? Again, even you even hear from the heavyweights in in the investment community. Um, with their pros and cons, um, but for the time being, this is very big for for our area uh, and what we do as um, an overall organization, and have a responsibility to our insurance clients and to you know Woodrow Sawyer to make sure we're ready for SPACs continuing and really understanding it better, talking to the uh, underwriting community to make sure we have underwriters who understand SPACs. So when we mention it. <laughs> We want to make sure they know what we're talking about. In fact, we're even doing education in the sh- with our surety team so that even uh, our account handlers know what a SPAC is. Uh, because, 
again, we have such a high profile in the uh, investment community and the tech community in our area mm-hmm. and in Boston and, and in another part in uh, Orange County. We have to be able to talk their language, you know, so they have confidence. If a high profile um, client of ours in the, in the tech world is about to go through a SPAC merger and they call me and say, we're going through a SPAC merger and I say, uh, what's a SPAC? <laughs> Obviously, very immediately, um, I lose Click. a lot of credibilities, and I'll probably be followed up with a few internal phone calls. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, we are preparing for it to continue. Uh, whether there'll be the growth we saw in 2021, you know, you know, I don't know. You know, there may be a cooling off in general of even IPOs, the traditional IPOs uh, going forward. But again, there's so many unknowns about our economy right now. I think there's a everybody's looking very positively about some a semblance of normalcy. And I think there's a lot of um, optimism. But again, how it translates into the specific area, that's hard to say. But uh, knowing what we've known so far and what we've seen, you know, shame on us if we're not prepared for it. Well, you know, it's, it's interesting. Um, you know, as, as you emphasize, building awareness is very important to enable these companies going forward. And then I think just to emphasize something uh, that you brought out, uh, the value of a professional surety bond producer and anticipating needs Mm -hmm. uh, is serving their client well and uh, certainly bringing awareness to any SPB community. And for those uh, bond producers who enjoy uh, serving their clients, anticipating needs, this seems like uh, possibly a great opportunity in the future. Yeah, and you know the NSBP. I, I even before obviously our recent virtual event, obviously professional and development has done a lot of good work as well as a com- commercial surety committee. Um, you know, looking at various types of new products in, or even changes and trends on Wall Street that could affect public entities. You know, this is one area where, at least from the Woodrow Sawyer standpoint, we view ourselves as a collection of ex- experts in certain areas, specific areas. And mine happens to be surety. You know, but I do rely on um, others within our firm. You know, when you and again, when you talk about being educated and, and knowing what you're talking about. So a few years ago, another good example would have been cryptocurrency. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. And of course, since who we are and where we are, including uh, even the Seattle area where we see a lot of growth. You know, we had to figure out how do we bond cryptocurrency accounts, either providing those who provide the technology, a cryptocurrency exchange. Um, Honestly, I can't say I still understand the intricacies, but I know people who do. I know um, some good surety companies that even they'll be like me, the underwriters who really don't know in depth the certain technologies that really are the backbone, but they could reach out to their own counterparts to understand better what is really the risk, what are the exposures, and they're able to utilize it to find an effective way to underwrite these types of companies, which really is an exposure we've never seen before. And so, you know, as a surety industry, everybody, you know, we're an old industry. We always talk about that when the first bond was written, how many years ago. You know, the surety bond for a cryptocurrency, for a company after a SPAC merger, or your traditional, say, manufacturer, the bonds may only be one page, but nobody uh, really knows the exposure on these new trends until they happen. And then it's really important for us as, a, as an industry, and then NSVP plays an important role from a professional development standpoint, to quickly identify these trends, understand what it means from an exposure standpoint, and so our brokers and underwriters could be educated really on um, how to properly assess risk, and let's face it, how to properly charge for it. Mm, yeah. um, that's just very important. And I don't know what the next trend is going to be. <laughs> We all wish we knew what the next trend was going to be. <laughs> yeah, well, I even know that um, we talk about blockchain. I just saw the email go by about NSPP's involvement in, in the uh, consortium on that. Right. And there was an article about how blockchain is going to really impact a different insurance line at some point 
I don't know if I'll uh, erase that line of business, but maybe make it less relevant. So thankfully, we have a lot of members within the surety community that are taking a hard look at blockchain right now knowing that either we get involved or we're going to be left behind. So I think we're all taking the right approach there. And that's a good example of seeing a trend coming to us, getting in early, understanding it. And so all our members in the industry as a whole knows what's coming and how to deal with it. That's terrific. Well, maybe we'll have you back on another time, Mark, and we can talk about blockchain and uh, cryptocurrency and all kinds of other fun tech things. (laughs) Well, I'm an old dog. I'm trying to learn some new tricks. Um, you know, there's a lot of good young producers um, <laughs> that have, uh, are much more technologically savvy than I am. I, I will tell you, we've, we write bonds for some websites. Mm-hmm. And, you know, some of my staff members that are frankly younger than me, they know that website. I've actually got to go onto the web and find out the, who our principal is because some of these websites, you know, it, selling luxury goods. Um, Frankly, I I don't do that. So (laughs) thankfully, we have a whole generation of young underwriters and brokers who are just have grown up in this world. And I think they'll be much more able to quickly adapt, identify trends and really figure out how as an industry, we could continue to support the new trends and stay relevant. Well, Mark, I I love what you said because um, it shows what a simulating career can can a young person have in the industry. That Mm. it's an ever changing industry, looking at risk and looking how to adapt the product uh, for the future, and that's pretty exciting. So, thanks so much for for sharing your thoughts on SPACs and other things, and (laughs) we look forward to our next conversation. And we'll see what that next t- technology is going to merge and how the surety industry deals with it. Absolutely. Thanks, Mark. All right. Thank you. You've been listening to Let's Get Surety, brought to you by the National Association of Surety Bond Producers. For more information about the NASBP and its members, visit nasbp.org. Before we go, we just wanted to say thank you again to Old Republic Surety for their generous support in sponsoring this episode of Let's Get Surety. For more information on Old Republic Surety, visit www.orsurety.com.